Ms. Jairam Kumbatkun speaking on behalf of uh, KSA Managing Committee. In fact, I was a little worried today by looking at the uh, audience, I feel little re relieved. I was expecting, you know, there are about 60, 70 Radhas and only one Krishna. But I find at least about four or five men over here, so I was relieved to, uh, relieved to that extent. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm supposed to do the welcome on behalf of the, all the three uh, institutions. On behalf of Kamat family, Shubha, Viba, and Anuja and their families, Saraswat Maila Samaj and Kendra Saraswat Association. I extend a hearty welcome to all of you uh, for this first ever function after the event was called as late Narendra Kamat and late Sadhna Pachi Kamat Memorial Lecture Series. Till last year it used to be only Narendra Kamat Memorial Lecture Series. So this is the first after the event was uh, decided to be organized by both, I mean, both the institution KSA and Saraswat Maila Samaj along with the family. Uh, welcome to you ma'am on this particular uh, function. I think you happen to be the first one after the uh, such event is being done by KSA as well as the Saraswat Maila Samaj. Welcome to all. Read so much about you on the internet. I think you would like to hear from Shiva. Thank you. Good evening. I feel privileged to introduce our speaker, Ms. Shanta Gokhale, renowned writer, journalist, translator, and theater critic. Most of us know of her many achievements, but I'd still like to tell you a little bit this evening. After completing her BA in English Literature from Bristol University and her MA from Bombay University, she taught at the Elphinstone College, then at the HR College of Commerce, and later at the Xavier's Institute of Communication. She has written columns on culture for various newspapers and magazines, and has edited the arts pages of the Times of India. She has also worked as PR executive for Glaxo Laboratories. It was her mother who suggested that she translate Marathi works into English in order to introduce the best of Marathi literature to a wider audience. She has translated essays, plays, short stories, poems, and novels from Marathi into English, including one of my mother's favorites, Lakshmibai Tilak's Smriti Chitri. She has also translated works from English into Marathi, including one of my favorites, Jerry Pinto's M and the Big Whom. The poet Nisim Ezekiel encouraged her to write in Marathi. Her first novel, Rita Velinkar, won the V. Sir Khandekar Award from the Maharashtra government. Her short stories have been published in prestigious journals like Abhiruchi, Satyakatha, and the Illustrated Weekly of India. She has written a critical study of Marathi theatre called Playwright at the Center, Marathi Drama from 1843 to the Present. She has also written plays and screenplays for films. She has edited the scenes we made, an oral history of experimental theater in Mumbai. In 2015, she won the Sangeet Natak Academy Award for her overall contribution to the performing arts. I am very happy that when Vibha requested her to speak here today, she accepted our invitation immediately. I am happy for two reasons. First, because I know that our mother held her in high esteem, as we all do, and greatly admired her mastery over both Marathi and English. Amma would often call her for a discussion on words, both Marathi and English. And second, 
because she is going to speak on a topic which was close to my parents heart both of them loved theater and passed on this love to all three of us in fact this topic was suggested by anu who does a lot of theater in bangalore we look forward to a very interesting talk but before that i would like to call upon vibha and anu to welcome her since i lost my voice you will please believe me if i say that my voice was like lata mangeshkar why not <laughs> who will challenge me <laughs> but uh, in these last 8 9 years uh, it comes and goes so sometimes you may lose a word also you'll have to put your imagination to work and fill in the blanks um i'm particularly happy to be here because sadhna tai was my phone friend um i had met her only once um when dilip and she descended from the same flight as i had taken to bangalore and uh, dilip i think we sat near each other in the coach and dilip introduced her to me and it was a face that stayed in my mind because uh, i'm going to use the marathi word for it it was prasanna there is no equivalent english word for that a smiling prasanna face very lively full of curiosity looking around asking questions and um, therefore a person after my heart after that she uh, would call me and always say misa cute voice she had girlish voice me sadna kamat bolte dilip disuzan chi sasu so i said okay the name has registered no need for relationships just say your sadna tai and that's enough so these conversations went on often on and at the end of each conversation she had to say tum sami phar ve ghetla and i would say nahi ho maza li <laughs> because a writer's life is very isolated it's you and your computer and that's it so if someone like that called in the middle of it it was like a fresh breeze blowing in so when we passed me to come and do this talk i said yes of course i <laughs> with most other people as mangala says <laughs> asiatic library has asked me very often and i always say nahi hu maza na awaz tras deto which is true it does <laughs> but sometimes you don't make excuses and this was one such occasion when i didn't feel like making an excuse so the subject that i was asked to speak about today is the changing trends in theater um I'm a little snooty about theatre, so 
I'll just make a little objection to the word trends. Trends are in fashion. I do not accept that word for theater, which for me is a serious form of art. So I will say changes or transformations in the form and content of theater. Uh, Indian theater is another word where we have to make certain clarifications because just as we don't say Indian language because we have 22 of them, we can't say Indian theater because we have 22 of those also. But broadly speaking, um, there are four categories of theater and I will quickly go through them so that we know why we will talk about only one of them. There is, of course, traditional theater of which one great example is Kerala's Kuriyatta, which has been with us. Uh, generally, we are bad at history. We don't have dates for things. So we put all these things under the rubric of ancient. So it's our most ancient form of theater and the only existing form of Sanskrit theater. It is traditional and therefore it does not change. Second category, folk theater. Maharashtra has its Tamasha, Gujarat has its Bhavai, and various other places have their own Nautanki in the north. These forms are extremely responsive to the circumstances, to the history around them, uh, uh, to the language, to the power structure, all these things. And whereas the stories they tell may be the same always, there is a character called Vidushak who takes it upon himself to ad lib, to comment on the present, current circumstances. And he has every right to criticize, to be funny at the expense of the biggest and the mightiest. Now, the two states in India where censorship of theater exists, one is Gujarat and the other is Maharashtra. Maharashtra has Tamasha and Tamasha is body, raunchy, often moving into the obscene. But our censors have not been able to touch it because these plays are not scripted. They're ad-libbed very often. And particularly the Vidushak ad-libs because he has to be responsive to the news of the day. So his script cannot be written down and he is the most offensive person. So there can be no censorship of him. Then there is uh, what I would call the theater of spectacle. There isn't too much of it happening in India, but there is something called mobile theater in Assam, where during the season, which is always 
the season for any theatre form anywhere in India is after harvest and before your sowing season begins. So during those six or seven months, mobile theatre packs all its sets into trucks and moves around the countryside performing plays. And they perform to audiences of thousands. It can go to a numbers like 10,000 also. And they are absolutely spectacular plays. Sometimes they are played on three stages. So there is no light fading out. One scene happens here, next scene happens there, third scene happens there, and the fourth on the first set again. So it's a continuous action. And uh, one of the plays of which I have seen a clip was called The Titanic. And it was based entirely on the film The Titanic. And the, sh uh, the stage was the ship. And the local carpenters had built a fantastic prow of the ship, which was required because at the end, the hero heroine had to go and stand like this <laughs> on it. The second spectacular theater is the Jatra of Bengal. And similarly, it is itinerant and it plays to thousands and thousands of people. None of these three categories of theater change in form. The form is always the same because they're catering to audiences uh, who are used to those forms and they come there entirely because they hope to see plays done in that form. So ultimately, the only theater that changes at all is the modern urban theater. And that is what concerns us today. I use the word modern, that too can be challenged. What is modern? What is not modern? As far as theater is concerned, modern began when music was dropped from theater. Everyone, every form of theater in India was strong on music. Um, Maharashtra had Sangeet Natak and Gujaratis had, um, what's it, Bhangwadi. So music was extremely important. Right at the beginning of Marathi theater, the very first play was based on um, both the Shavatar and, um, oh, sorry, it happens to me more and more nowadays. I just forget words. Anyhow, um, the Raja of Sangli said to his courtier, very clever man, said, I want you to prepare a theater entertainment for the court based on this kind of performance. But you will not have dance. So as far as Maharashtra was concerned, dance was out. But the Gujaratis love dance. So Bhangwadi was music as well as dance, as well as speech. Now, there were two major centers in India of theater. Uh, Bangalore has just arrived <laughs> 20 years ago when I was writing my book, Playwright at the Center. 
I thought I had to take a look at the other theatres in India. So I spent time in Calcutta where every day I was watching two plays. I went to Bangalore and I said, uh, I want to see a play. And they said, oh, you'll have to go to Mysore. So I said, why? I mean, don't you do theatre? Yes, yes, we do theatre, but you can't just say you want to see a play and we show you a play. Doesn't happen that way. Problem, of course, was that there was no dedicated space for theatre. Any place which doesn't have a dedicated space for theatre doesn't have a regular theatre activity. It cannot have. So it was only after Ranga Shankara came into being in Bangalore that theatre took off. Madras doesn't have theatre. There was a long discussion in a seminar once where someone from Maharashtra said, hey, Madras has no theatre. So a person from Madras got really pissed off and uh, she said, uh, is there dance in Maharashtra? So there isn't, of course. We don't have our own classical dance and that kept the speaker quiet. So a uh, point is that uh, certain communities have certain strengths and theatre is not everybody's strength. So it exists in Bengal, it exists in Maharashtra, it exists in Karnataka and it exists in Kerala and Manipur. But modern theatre, only in the metros, Calcutta, Bombay and Bangalore. There is a reason for this, as I was saying. Uh, way back in uh, the third decade of the 20th century, a lot of young people who had come out of Bombay University, that they had been exposed to playwrights like Shaw and the Norwegian playwright, Henrik Ibsen, and of course Shakespeare. Shakespeare fitted right in to the mold of our own classical theater. Five acts, lots of uh, actors and going in, coming out, all sorts of things happening, events, long speeches, soliloquies, all of that could be accommodated into theatre as it existed. But what did you do with Ibsen? Ibsen was the modern playwright. He was breaking all sorts of boundaries in his own country and was being hailed as a consummate practitioner of realistic theatre. Realistic theatre is very much a mark of modernity because what it does is not to concentrate on myths and legends kings and queens, but on us, you and I, and our problems, our tensions, how we resolve those tensions, how we as individuals relate to our society. If the society is conservative, how does the individual who wants to break through, how does that individual achieve her objective. So in all of this, the play that became a kind of cult play for young 
Marathi theater people was Doll's House. And Doll's House, um, where our practitioners saw it as a woman, very simplistically, as a woman who leaves her husband's house. That's it. Why she does so? How the social norms and conventions <coughs> are brought into their house by the husband, by people who visit the house, and therefore how she feels suffocated and how gradually she thinks, who am I? Am I what these people want to make me? Am I a doll? Am I here just for decoration and to take orders and to please? Do I have something of my own which I need to discover? And it is this questioning of herself that finally allows her to make this radical decision of leaving the house. A question gets asked, so what would she do outside? Society is what it is. Here's a woman, no qualifications, no knowledge of the world. So she is leaving the house, what will happen? One of our playwrights, Rajiv Naik, wrote a play called uh, Ghar, just that, I think. And uh, he creates a similar situation where the woman leaves the house. But that happens in the first scene. And then the woman comes back because she finds that she is unable to deal with the world outside. Which, of course, he wrote because he's a man. If I had written that play, I would have found lots of things for this woman to do outside and do it well. We know any number of women who, when their husbands fall ill, need to be taken care of. Women who are in Parda will go and sit in the shop and conduct the husband's business and maybe do better than the husband. So, but this kind of question did get asked and a lot of playwrights, therefore, weren't able to face this extremely modern action of a woman leaving the house. Lots of copies of this play followed, of course. And about one of them, I have a story to tell. It was called Kulavadhu, written by M.G. Ramlekar, who also directed it. Now, in this play, a very modern situation is taken on by the playwright. The man has lost his job. The house has to be run, so the woman must work. And in those days, as we know from Durga Khote's autobiography, the only way for women to earn well, women who had no qualifications, was to enter this new field called cinema. So this heroine begins to act in films and as is our habit, uh, we instantly stigmatize we don't necessarily know that person. We don't know 
whether she is good, bad, virtuous, not virtuous. The fact that she is acting in films makes her bad, makes her instantly a wicked woman with whom we should not keep in touch. So this woman is reviled by her husband's family and they come stay there trying to check out what she is like. They go on the shoot and then they discover that she isn't flirting with anyone. She's just sitting in a corner after finishing her work and keeping to herself. So suddenly there is a Hridaya Parivartan and everyone says, wow, what a woman, except the husband. Husband is suffering from an inferiority complex. How can a woman be earning when he is sitting at home? So he makes life so miserable for her that she decides to leave the house. But there is a cop out. She goes and lives with her parents-in-law. She is not Nora. She is very traditional. She is not modern. She doesn't want to go in search of herself. She wants to prove again and again that she is a good woman in the old conventional sense. So she goes to stay with her parents-in-law. Now the story. M.G. Ramnekar does the first show in Opera House and comes back home. And he finds two gentlemen waiting for him at home. And uh, they are saying to him, yeah, all this is very well. But she'll come back to the husband, no? <laughs> so Ramnekar says, look, my play ends where the play ends. If you want to give it a life beyond that, you bring her back. It's your choice. But it's important to note that audiences have a very big influence on the kinds of plays that we get to see. Which brings me to the point of the first change. Here, there was a kind of sitting on the fence, not quite here, not quite there. It happened also, by the way, with music. It was seen that Ibsen and Bernard Shaw don't have people singing in their plays. And they are the modern playwrights. If we want to be modern playwrights, we can't have people singing in our plays. So when the first imitation of uh, Ibsen type play was done called Andhrayanchi Shara, it was decided no music, no songs. And then gradually, they thought, but who will come? If we don't have songs, who will come and see our play? So then the trick, the usual trick, which has also been used in the old days in the radio shrutikas that they used to have, Vaini Gana Munaho, and Vaini would begin singing. So similarly, the heroine of this play um, had a good voice and could sing. So at any point in the play, you could insert a song. And so this play, Andhra Jishara, had some four or five songs. And since Jyotsna Bhore was acting in that, and I mean, <laughs> you had a great voice as well. So music and modernity 
there's been a little bit of conflict there. The moment that music was thrown out of plays was perhaps you can call the first modern moment in Marathi theatre and in Gujarati theatre. And this moment came at the hands of Vijay Tendulkar. He was the first, in that sense, the first modern playwright in Marathi. And that time, those decades of the 60s and 70s, were decades of change. Change was happening everywhere. Change was happening in um, Paris, in London, in New York, everywhere. And same as here in Bombay. So Tendulkar turned his back on what, let us call it, mainstream Marathi theater, which um, uh, revived some of the old plays. Even the new plays could have music, all that kind of thing was going on. Then a theater called Shivaji Mandir came up and that became the center for mainstream theater. And you had a whole lot of people writing extremely sentimental plays where, uh, as uh, Mahesh El Kunjwa, the playwright, has said in one of his statements that on the stage somewhere is talking about making pickles and the audience is pulling out its handkerchiefs and sobbing into them. So all kinds of things were made into a sentimental kind of um, uh, tear-jerking devices. This is something that Tendulkar turned his back on and gave us, for instance, a play like Sakharam Binder. There was no singing there. There was bad language. Uh, there were women who um, also used bad language. And then he wrote Vultures, Gidhare, more bad language, had lots of trouble with censors. The censors wouldn't allow these plays to be staged. For Gidhare, they said, look at this language. One of the censors said, I'm going to come and watch this show and then take a decision whether it should be allowed or not. So he sat there, he saw the play, and then his remark was that the woman next to me couldn't bear to look at what was happening. She was looking down all the time. So Sri Ram Lagu, who was directing the play, said, were you watching the play or looking at the woman? <laughs> the censor said, this language will not do. So Lagu said, the name of the play is Gidhari. It is not Chimnya. <laughs> so they will speak the language that they speak. And they just went ahead and did the play as it was. So 60s and 70s belonged very much to Tendulkar in Maharashtra. There was Badal Sarkar, who was hailed as the modern playwright of Bengal. What he turned his back on was the kind of propagandist political play that was being done in Calcutta. Then there was Mohan Rakesh in Delhi. He actually created the tradition of playwriting 
because Hindi didn't have playwrights. And the reason why Hindi didn't have playwrights, my hunch is that you, for theater, you need a living language, a language that has vitality, which has a connection with the soil. Hindi is a constructed language. Nowhere in the so-called Hindi heartland do people in their homes use that kind of Sanskritized Hindi. They use their bolis, avadhi, and, uh, you know, again, I've lost those names anyhow. So each of these dialects had their own theatres. And beautiful theatre was being done in those dialects. But Hindi, where are the roots of Hindi? Hindi doesn't have roots. So there was no way that it could grow into a playwriting tradition. So Mohan Rakesh actually started that tradition in Hindi. And then, of course, we have Girish Karnad from Karnataka, though he was much more Bombay in those days, because he was working with uh, the Oxford University Press and very much part of the Bombay theater scene. And uh, at the center of all this new theater activity in Bombay was a gentleman by the name of Satyadev Dube. He was a total dynamo. He was completely, passionately, obsessively dedicated to theater. And for him, it was important to spread theater everywhere. So Badal Sarkar's play came to Bombay and went to Amol Palekar. Amol Palekar knew Bengali. He got it translated, and he directed the play. Mohan Rakesh's play came to Bombay. It was in Hindi. Dubey did it in Hindi. Girish Karnad approached him and said, I have a play. Now, Girish Karnad's reputation had preceded him. Here's a man who's had the Rhodes Scholarship. He's been to Oxford. And now he has come back. So Dubey automatically assumed that his play was in English. So hum slaves zamana. So he wanted to do only Hindi plays or plays in other languages. So poor Girish and Dubey was that high, and Girish was that high. But Girish tried to look small and said, no, my play is in Kannada, if you don't mind. So Dubey said, really? Let's get it translated. So there began another connection with Girish. So these four people, Girish, Vijay Tendulkar, Badal Sarkar, Mohan Rakesh, were seen as the four men who led the new modern theater movement. Now, of course, there are people who will say, very smart young people who will say, who is Dubey? Who is Girish Kata? You know, that has to happen. Young people have to first question the people before them. They have to reject them before they can produce something new. So what is now happening in theater generally in Bombay? Um, we have English theater happening, Hindi theater, 
Gujarati, Marathi. I think we are probably the only city, the only center in the whole of India where four important theaters happen at one and the same time. And each has a different history, a different trajectory. As far as Gujarati theater is concerned, they started with the same Sangeet Natak type of play. They also moved into a modern play, a theater, uh, where there was no singing, no dancing. But the Gujarati theater goer is a Gujarati theater goer. What he and she wants is entertainment. When I was editing the arts page in Times of India, uh, I had a contributor called Parat Trivedi. And he used to write about Gujarati theater for me. And he once said to me, um, it's very easy to tell the good character from the bad character in Gujarati theatre. They don't believe in grey shades. They believe in black and white. It's a very simple kind of proposition. You know whose side you are on. You don't have to think. You can just laugh and have a good time. So he said, the minute a character lights a cigarette on stage, you know, bad man. <laughs> as simple as that. So, and for, for them, even today, if you go to a Gujarati play, uh, interval is devoted to a lot of eating, <laughs> but interval is also devoted to a lot of discussion about the dinner that they will have <laughs> afterwards. So, it is a kind of package deal. You go to theatre, you eat. You go to theatre, you go and eat. And theatre has to understand this. Theatre must understand that it cannot spoil its audience's mood by being difficult, by putting before them complex problems. No. Just Keep it simple. So the trajectory and history of Gujarati theater comes from a community that wants to live well and has the means to live well. Their tickets, by the way, are approaching 1,500. Marathi theater is just crawling to 300. And even then, producers say, Salel ka, na ko paas So, because it is a theater that is patronized by not just the upper middle class, but the lower middle class also. And more and more by people who come from the mill areas and have grown up on the Kamgar Rangabhumi. Now, uh, Marathi theatre, of course, as I said, is in contrast. English theatre began with his nose very much in the air because they had the master's language. And that, in those days, in the 60s, all the way to the 70s was an extremely important asset. So they felt an obligation, a moral obligation, to give to the Indian audience what they couldn't get firsthand in England or America because they weren't rich enough to travel there. So let us do them a favor and give them what they are missing. 
So all the plays that were done in English during those years were imported. Anything that was doing well in the West End on Broadway soon came to Bombay and was lapped up by people who were still suffering from a colonial hangover. It took them a long time to come out of this. Um, another 10 years, 15 years, during which they struggled, they started a competition for playwrights in English. Sultan Padamsi, the um, play award. And the understanding was that the plays that got chosen uh, for the first two ranks would be produced by theater group. Theater group was the big theater group of those days. The competition was held, people were selected, but their plays were not produced. Because once again, the question was, will the kind of audience that comes to see our plays accept something that has Indian themes? There was a lot of doubt about this. And so these plays never got produced. There's a playwright called Cyrus Mistri, who wrote a wonderful play called Dungaji House. Beautiful play. It got staged 12 years after it won the prize. And not by theatre group, by somebody else altogether. Then came a Bangalore man called Mahesh Dattani. Mahesh was uh, very interested in theatre, passionate about it, and uh, writing in English and writing about uh, themes uh, which also belong out there. And nothing was working. Wasn't working for him himself. Forget the audience. One day he saw a Gujarati play. And he saw the reaction of the audience. He saw how they were responding heart and soul to what was happening on the stage. And he realized that it is not just the language. It is the content which is holding. Now, he is a Gujarati-speaking person, but like many Indian people, and I'm sounding depressed, he has only one language, and that is English. So he couldn't write in Gujarati. He began writing in English, as he had been doing, but writing about things which were close to him in the community in which he was living. And from the first play, he had the response that he had been looking for. And it, it just gave him such a high. By then, our moralist critics had begun to question English language itself. Anyone who dared write in English would have these people coming up and say, English? Why? Master's language? You're still writing it. Why can't you write in an Indian language? And uh, Mahesh was the first person not to bow down to this sort of bullying. He said, English is an Indian language. 
take it or leave it and continue to write it. And now, of course, English is an Indian language. We have made it our own. We speak it in our own way. Maybe the way we speak it, people who are born to the language don't even understand us. But it's okay. We understand each other. So Mahesh Tatani continued to write in his own English. And he, that was a, another big change, that he opened up theater to the English language and allowed English to be used for Indian themes. Since then, English has uh, moved very rapidly through many kinds of changes. And Marathi, which once was in the lead uh, of experimental theater, is now not doing too much of it. And the reason, of course, is that Marathi theater, unlike Gujarati theater, never paid well. There's a lovely book called uh, Me Mithachi Bahuli, written by a woman who used to act both in Marathi and Gujarati plays. And uh, her uh, family was a needy family, so she needed to earn much more than she could get in Marathi theater. So she started acting in Gujarati theater. She joined a company. And in her autobiography, she says, I was getting 300 rupees a month. Wow. Never heard of such a sum being given to an actor who was not even given heroine's role. She was a side heroine, as they call her. But 300 rupees a month back then was some money. Marathi um, actors don't get that kind of money. And therefore, for them, television has become a huge magnet. They have the writing skills, they have the acting skills, and they are working 24 hours of the day for television. Sulbha Pande used to say, Kai ga mendu ghari thaun zaitza. Sundar sadi ne saichi, dile lea oli bolaicha, ani ghari yachan mong mendu puna ghalun yachan. But it helps them earn. It helps them buy their own flats, their own cars. It is a huge loss, of course, for Marathi theater. But English theater has moved on. And I will now come to the last kind. I mean, there are lots of changes happening. Uh, one person shows, for instance, are happening. One person shows are done because in Bombay, it's very difficult for people to commute, find time to meet, to rehearse. So if you are doing a one-person show, you're by yourself. You are in front of your mirror. And you go and act simple. So that's the reason for one-person shows. But there's a new thing called devised theater. Everywhere in the world, people have become a little fed up with playwrights. Playwrights at one time were drivers of change. They were the people who introduced new forms, new ideas, and not just new forms and ideas. The kind of language that they used forced actors to act in different ways also. 
actors who are used to long speeches couldn't speak Tendulkar's lines because they were crisp, short, with lots of pauses and a lot of things unsaid which the actor would have to express through body, through expression, rather than through word. So uh, playwrights were actually driving the change in theater. But actors began to feel that what they write sitting at their desks is not what we feel most concerned about. We want to be part of the creative process. So the playwright has been jumped. Instead of which, a group of actors will come together and along with a director, or sometimes even without a director, they will just direct themselves. They will throw up ideas. What, what do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? They pull all the ideas together. And then uh, suddenly one idea may spark interest in most of the group. So that idea is taken up. For instance, Atul Kumar did a devised play some eight or nine years ago. Uh, they all came to a decision that they would like to explore the theme of memory. And to do that, they read up um, psychologists' books. They talk to each other about their own personal memories. And slowly, through rehearsal, they brought together a kind of play. I say a kind of play because it was very different. Um, and uh, they presented it and they opened it out to the audience. That also has become a new thing, a change, that you allow the audience to, in some way, participate in what is happening on the stage. So this form of theater is called devised theater. And a lot of young groups are now doing that. Audience participation. Uh, is, is done in different ways. It can be done with an actor suddenly breaking off from co uh, dialogue with co-actor and turning to the audience and saying, what do you think? And waiting for an answer. Audience participation is called for sometimes at the end of a play where they say, OK, this is how we thought we should end this play. What do you think? So whoever has an idea on the spot starts a discussion, and a whole lot of people will then join in. But the most interesting and, in some ways, disconcerting experience of audience participation, which I was present at, was a script of sorts written by uh, Naveen Kishore, who runs Seagull Books in Calcutta. And uh, it was a very, very abstract thing. And he had not written it as a play. But we were invited to this performance. And we were not told what it was going to be. We were only told that we had to confirm our presence because only 18 people were going to form the audience. Only 18. The venue was a restaurant 
on the first floor of a building in South Bombay. We arrived there not knowing what was going to happen. And we were shown our seats. We all sat around. And it was a long table. And some of us knew each other. We greeted each other and waiting for the play to begin. Where is the play going to begin? There was no stage. There was just this oval table. And uh, all the chairs were taken. So uh, it was a little mysterious. And then even as we were talking, some two people uh, began talking across to each other. And uh, we looked at each other. Why are they talking loudly? I mean, we are talking softly to each other. Why are they shouting like that? So uh, we listened to what they were saying, because we had to. We couldn't understand a word. It was all abstract. And um, then uh, one of them spoke to someone. I mean, the person whom I had greeted next to me. And I looked at her as if, you traitor. You, you are part of this. So it went. There were about five actors sitting around the table. And they were actually presenting uh, Naveen Kishore's script. And then we realized that the director is standing there. And there's a camera going. So we thought we are being had. Something that we don't know is going on. So some of them clamped up. Just wouldn't look right or left. If you are doing something to me, I'm going to do something to you. Others kept on responding and reacting to what was happening. And at the end, we were told this was the play. <laughs> we were also the actors. And our expressions and responses had been recorded. And uh, we weren't quite sure how to look at this. Some of us felt uh, th this fast one that they had pulled on us was, was a bit of cheating. Others felt, oh, it was fun. But all of this showed on our expressions. So I, I would say that's a most extreme kind of experimental theater that can also happen. There is site-specific theater, like you look at a deep well and say, oh, I think I've got an idea for a play. So you do your play in the well. And the audience stands all around you. The Ram Leela, uh, I said earlier that folk and traditional theater does not change. Ram Leela has been done all across a whole area. One scene acted here, the whole audience is like this. Then they walk. That's the jungle. So all of us go to the jungle and watch that scene and so on. At the end of it, of course, the audience is as tired as the actors. But it's a new experience. It's a new way of doing theater. So the whole point now is to actually break all boundaries. In the earlier days, we thought theater meant a play. A play meant a story. So you had a beginning, middle, end. At the end, everyone said, ah, nice or awful, whatever. 
but you had a response at the end because you had understood everything that had gone on. You had been told a story. Now people are not telling stories. People are being very difficult. They are challenging you. The idea is that you should not be sitting comfortably in your seats. And that has become a criterion. You will see in uh, uh, reviews written by serious critics, there was nothing disturbing in the play. <laughs> so then you get one star. So not only has form and content changed, but the, the uh, idea of what theatre is or should be has also undergone a change. And um, I always say when uh, people, well, not so much now, but I remember about 10 years ago, people in theatre, generally the older people, would say, Theatre is dying. Theatre didn't die. Theatre does not die. Theatre is one of the first forms of human expression. We are born to take on roles and act roles. In our daily life, we are all acting. So theatre is a very instinctive thing. Secondly, theater, unlike cinema and television, is a primitive art. It does not require technology. If you have it, use it. But if you don't have it, two people can stand here, right here, not even with mics, and do theater, and you will be captivated. So theatre will not die for this reason. And fact is, of course, that now I hear a lot of young people who have never been to theatre before. I've had a young person sitting next to me and uh, in the interval saying, ma'am, do you watch this sort of thing often? So I said, yeah, like, uh, it's part of my life. But it's so great. It's my first time. And I'm going to keep coming. So theater can also be a kind of revelation for people because it gives you the flesh and blood human presence. In the old days, I remember Satish Ayakar, the playwright, said his first um, amazement at theatre was when he was taken backstage to be introduced to an actor whom he had just seen. And the actor had been playing some noble hero or something. And backstage in the green room, he was sitting with his legs wide apart, smoking a cigarette. And Satish thought, same chap, same chap. That is the magic of theater, and that is why theater is not ever going to die. Thank you.
So you want to know about how it started? No, I mean how, because when you talked about urban theatre, we, uh, we were, I mean, you talked about Mohan Rakesh and yeah, yeah. that uh, group. However, I think Prithviraj and that group was much earlier. Yeah, yes. So, uh, at yeah, that yeah. time... I get it. Yeah. Uh, three theatres and Ikta yeah. were two, yeah, yeah. two groups which predated the modern Hindi theatre. And uh, Ikta uh, was ideologically dedicated to the left. So a lot of its plays were uh, within that ideology. So in a sense, it didn't open up to the general audience. It had its own. And actually in Calcutta, some of the theatre people who had first started with Ipta left IPTA because they felt that the ideological binding was too restrictive for them. So that was, and IPTA was doing excellent work, but within its own kind of uh, framework. Um, and Prithviraj Kapoor was doing a, a kind of version of Parsi theatre. Parsi theatre was also spectacle and uh, it, it was Gujarati, Urdu, these two languages. And with uh, Viraj's plays, if you saw them, were also absolutely spectacular. The difference was, and this was an extremely important difference, that he was politically very aware when uh, when he did his plays, they were not for just entertainment, as Parsi theatre plays were. They were for edification of the audience. And that is why, uh, actually, uh, he made a lot of losses also. Uh, because he put this above uh, the business part of theatre. Whereas Parsi theatre uh, put business first, so it survived. But it was quite magnificent. But then, you know, by about uh, the mid 40s, I think, uh, he had grown old, he had lost a lot, so it, it was wound up. Um, whereas this movement started in the 60s. Uh, and by then, there was uh, hardly any, uh, except Ipta, Ipta country. But Isma Chukta and all, were they from that group or they were much later? Isma Chukta, well, she was not a playwright. No, she wasn't. She was a writer. She was a writer. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Uh, ma'am, you said that uh, from 60s to 70s in Marathi theatre, the musical plays started going off because, and they went into mainstream uh, Marathi theatre. But in say last part, uh, about five years or so, five six years, these musical plays have started coming back, but not the new ones. The old ones have come in the in a different fashion. What could be the reason for that in that case? Nostalgia. <laughs> There are still lots of people who believe that Sangeet Nada is the only theatre. Nothing that happened afterwards is worth watching. So then there was a gentleman called Vidyadhar Gokhale. And uh, he came up with a lot of new, not just revivals, a lot of new scripts for Sangeet Nada because he knew how interested the audience was in music. And in fact, um, the reason why the Sangeet Natak itself died was because a point came where the music overwhelmed the drama, where 
a singer, a singer, actor could actually uh, start a mahfil on the stage and uh, the story would sort of be sent off into the winds <laughs> to be brought in later. And uh, it, it was so bad, let me say, that for instance the music composer Manraj Bhatia once told me that uh, there was in a particular play, a particular song which his father and he loved. And they timed it, say, two o'clock in the morning. One Raj was woken up and they got into their Ghoda Gadi or whatever it was and drove to the theatre <clears throat> and caught that song just right. That's all they wanted to hear. At the end of the song, they went home. So music has that kind of a hold on the audience. And I'll tell you another story about a play, Gujarati play, in which it's a kind of Romeo and Juliet story in which uh, both of them commit suicide at the end. But of course they meet in heaven. And in heaven there's a chula coming down from the skies. So both of them in the last scene are sitting on this jula, being very happy with each other. So that made the audience immensely happy. But before they meet in heaven, they have to die. Now the man dies. The woman uh, sings before she dies. It's a very sad song. Don't worry, I'm coming. We are going to but she wasn't allowed to die once more. <laughs> so she would sing that song again. Finally, that poor playwright came on the stage and said, are you going to let her die or not? <laughs> Otherwise, she won't meet him in heaven. <laughs> so music got carried to these kinds of levels. And ultimately then, uh, the, the play itself couldn't last, it couldn't hold. And meanwhile, of course, cinema came in, so that was the last nail in the coffin. Three ladies first. It's a brilliant overview of changes in the, in the theatre in the last 20, 30 years. I have a question about Marathi theatre, or maybe an observation. In my youth, it was localized, it was Dada, Girga, Parra. But in the last 10 years, I see a very interesting trend. You see Ek Shunyati, various other, Samudra, various other plays shown at the Tata Little Theatre. And the audience is a very sophisticated Western audience who earlier went only for English plays. How would you explain this change? Um, that audience uh, is not a Western audience. They are Marathi. I see many others also, Parsis come there, are friends of ours who would never have seen a Marathi play. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. These last eight years I've seen this change. Right, right. Because there are lots of, see, um, Marathis um, have moved from being just middle class to becoming a little upper crust. And quite a few of them live in South Bombay. And uh, now, uh, 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 is practically closed. You have to take into account the movement of the middle class. It has moved from Gita, sold off to Gujaratis, Marwatis, etc. It moved to Shivaji Park first. So you got Shivaji Mandir and Rabindra Natya Mandir. Then, now I live in Shivaji Park and there are towers there and lots of those kinds of people are staying in those towers because they are very expensive flats. So a lot of Marathi people moved then 
to places like Dombivi, Kalyanu, etc. And theatres followed them. That's the point. Because the Marathi uh, Manus loves his theatre, theatre spaces follow him. And, and that's why now I find that uh, I had to have to wait for weeks and weeks before a new play gets shown in Shivaji Mandir. They're all happening at the other end. And then this, of course, uh, of the Marathi plays was uh, almost entirely because of Deepa Gahlod. When she was looking after theatre and uh, she was very keen on Marathi and Gujarati theatre. So she started all these um, things, there's something called Navevar, and it's for film, but similar things, you know, features which she introduced into NCPA and they're still carrying on. So plays a uh, center stage and stuff like that. So now, on a regular basis, Marathi plays are being shown at NCPA. And Barsi is a sweet, they go to anything. <laughs> um, I had a question about uh, you, in, uh, your question about music in plays. Uh, how do you look at um, modern playwrights who began to sort of reclaim those traditions in their modern oriented plays? Say with a Girish Karna who wrote songs and the Ganesh Vandana into his script for Hayavadan. But it was a, in a very modern play and speaking about, um, and he looked at a western adaptation of it and so on. But reclaiming these very traditional Indian practices into the modern way. See, um, in the mid-80s or so, late 70s, mid-80s, um, there was a secretary of the Sangeet Nandak Academy called Suresh Avasti. And he introduced a scheme for young people, young theatre directors, to go out into the villages and look at traditional forms of theatre and to bring them together with urban actors and create plays so that uh, there was something of our roots in urban plays. Now, this was a government scheme and a lot of young uh, theatre directors entered into the scheme and some very good plays were done in those days. But suddenly, when this happened, people sat up uh, and, sorry, and meanwhile, Western directors had started coming to India and picking up our theatre traditions in which there was music and dance. Um, so suddenly young people woke up to the fact that we have these rich traditions and fine, there was a phase when modern theatre was defined in a certain way. We've gone beyond that. And now let's have music. And so lots of plays got, I've written two plays with lots of music in it. But the point is that unlike that uh, the, uh, ridiculous extreme which the Sangeet Nata reached where the songs had nothing to do with the drama. Now when you go to a play, which has songs in it. Those songs are part of the narrative. That is the new way in which music has been brought in. And Sunil Shambhav's plays now are devoted to using music in the plays. So it is, it's, a, it's I think it's a wonderful move that uh, uh, asserts some of our own values while we have already taken what belongs elsewhere. 
answer your question. Bhopal was um, uh, no <laughs> because uh, you know it, it tended to be restricted to its its own kind of media and it wasn't part of its objectives at all to spread theatre as such. But V.V. Kalant, who was there, was earlier at the NSD. And that's where he had a major influence on theatre. In fact, V.V. Kalant, excuse me, V.V. Kalant was uh, hugely responsible for uh, bringing music into. He could never do a play without music. And uh, in fact, Hayabadana was done in practically every language in India. But um, uh, Girish always said that uh, Karant is the one who turned it into a musical. It was written with music, but he just built up the music to such an extent that it became a musical as such. Yeah. So he had an influence. Uh, I was just bringing back to this note for this uh, music. I just was point you made about how uh, uh, Sangeet Naga had taken you know, to an extreme where the music was irrelevant to the story, I think you were saying, and then now it's come back to where it's, it's been more. Is, that, is, there, is there a similar trend in Hindi cinema to that effect? I mean, it seems to me also that uh, in Hindi cinema, yeah, in Bollywood films, uh, was, there, was there a similar increase in the number of songs and all to a point where it got, where some songs had nothing to do with stories? No, I thought Hindi films always had a but proliferation but, of songs. But what, I, what I'm trying to get at is, it, is, it, is it, could we say that nowadays the songs are a little more relevant to the story? For example, ha, 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 a, ha, there's a Gandhi poem way. Where the, which is just driven by the song. So that know. way. I think uh, we have now a, a group of um, thinking uh, directors, film directors, and uh, who uh, understand the power of music uh, and use it for that power. Um, so, yes, I, but <laughs> I don't see films much. Sorry. I, Hindi, I, never mind. I don't see Hindi. <laughs> to have you in our midst. Is privileged enough, this is okay. Thank you so much, ma'am, for talking to us about the different forms of theatre all over India. You brought out the transition beautifully, along with the impact it had on the audience, the actors, and the writers. Thank you very much. Uh, I would also like to thank Mr. Asamkar for the sound system, Mr. Bhavesh for the seating arrangement and to Guru Prasad Caterers for providing the snacks which are jointly sponsored by Saraswat Mahila Samaj and Canada Saraswat Association. And of course, my thanks to all of you for coming. Without you, this program would have no meaning. Please help yourselves to the snacks before you leave.